All right. You're in track three for the Pac-Man attack with Joseph Ravachandran. So welcome, and uh, he's a first time speaker. Thank you all so much. All right, so welcome to Pac-Man, uh, breaking Pac on the Apple M1 with hardware attacks. And so my name is Joseph Ravi Chandran. Uh, I'm a first year student, just finished up my first year at MIT. Uh, I just graduated last year from the University of Illinois where I was a proud member of Sig Pony, which I believe is here. Let's go. <laughs> Thanks, Ian. And uh, yeah, so I, I researched hardware security at MIT. This project was a joint effort between me and my collaborators Juan, Jay, and Mengja, who is our fearless leader. And so we, uh, in our group, what we do is try to focus on every aspect of hardware security, from attacks, like we're gonna do today, to defenses, formal verification, all sorts of good stuff. Uh, but like I said, today is an attack project. Uh, and so you might have seen our paper that came out about this a month ago uh, in the ISCA conference. So pacmanattack.com, you can get all the, all the details from that. Uh, so this was our, our first introduction to the world about what Pac-Man is. Uh, but it is my great pleasure today to explain, or, or to introduce to you rather, Pac-Man version 2. So this has not been publicly released yet. But we have a great new re, uh, reproduction of the attack, lots of improvements, and lots of really cool stuff. Uh, and so ARM came out with this release about our, our project, uh, talking about what Pac-Man is and, and what's affected. And it turns out that it's actually not just limited to M1, but it actually affects a whole lot of other processors too. Uh, and so the Pac-Man technique we think is actually quite a uh, powerful technique and can be used for a lot of other things besides just pointer authentication. All right, so in the research literature, a lot of groups tend to focus on the software side of things or the hardware side of things. So you've got this great body of research in microarchitectural attacks and in software attacks, like you know, return-oriented programming, all that good stuff. Uh, but what, what's kind of lacking, or what we thought might, could, could be improved, is what happens when you bring these two worlds together? What kinds of new attacks are possible when you consider the, the cracks that lie between these two threat models? And so Pac-Man is our vision of a synergistic attack that combines both what's great about software and what's great about hardware. And so we call Pac-Man a hardware-software co-attack. And so Pac-Man comes with three main contributions. The first is a new way of thinking about these compounding threat models. The second is a hardware bypass for pointer authentication. That's kind of the name of the game. And the third is a real implementation of this attack on the Apple M1 chip. And so today, I kind of want to come at the story of Pac-Man from two different perspectives. So when we see dark slides like the ones on the left, we're going to be thinking like attackers. So when we see stuff like that, I want you to be thinking, how can we break this? But when we see things like a light slide on the, on the right, we're going to be thinking as CPU designers. So what kinds of choices could CPU architects have made that lead to attacks like this? So coming at the same idea from two perspectives. And so by the end of today's talk, I'd like you, the audience, to come up with an answer to this question. Namely, is this a flaw? Or is Pac-Man a consequence of multiple things coming together? And so instead of boring you with all the details about the attack and you know, memory corruption, all that stuff, I'm going to give you the entire idea in 60 seconds. So stay with me here. A lot of the memory corruption attacks that you see, they, they kind of all follow the same pattern, right? You get the ability to read and write memory that you shouldn't. You change a function pointer somewhere. So you know, return pointer, vtable entry, something like that. And now you've got arbitrary code execution. And so the smart folks over at ARM said, hey, this memory uh, read-write memory thing has been around for 40 years. We've try to solve it with all sorts of techniques, and we just can't. So let's instead add a barrier at the end here that blocks this step. So changing function pointers now doesn't let you arbitrarily change the pointer, because we, we're going to sign the pointers with a cryptographic hash, OK? And so if you could find a way to forge these signatures, you could bypass this protection. And so you might be thinking, OK, why not just try them all? Like, it's just a 16-bit signature. Why not just brute force them? Well, the problem is if you try to evaluate an incorrectly signed pointer, so if you're trying to brute force this code, you're going to crash. And since today's target is the kernel, you're actually going to crash your kernel, completely reboot your device. So that's not great. And our solution, this is the key takeaway from Pac-Man, is that you can actually avoid these crashes by doing your tests in the speculative regime. And so we're going to talk about what speculation is and how to exploit it uh, in this talk. And so that's kind of an overview of the, the, your mental roadmap of Pac-Man. So we envision Pac-Man as a BYOB. It's, it's bring your own bug. So if you look at uh, back to this, this graph here, 
uh, Pac-Man, or rather, the attacker is going to come up with this part. So find a read-write gadget and change some function pointer, and Pac-Man's going to handle this end, so defeating the Pac feature. And so today it is a great honor to introduce four brand new tools that we've developed in-house for this research that we're going to be sharing with you all today, as well as two proof of concept implementations. So the first tool is Pac-Man Kit. Then we have Pac-Man Finder, Pac-Man Patcher, and Pac-Man OS. So let's start with Pac-Man Kit. So Pac-Man Kit is your best friend as a microarchitectural security researcher looking to do attacks on Apple Silicon. It's got everything you need. It's got the basics, kernel read, write, execute, all the stuff that you're looking for as someone looking to cross privileges and do some tests. But it also comes with the other tools that you might commonly need. So if you want to read an address and see how long does it take the kernel to load this address, this can do that. If you want to translate a virtual address from user space to its physical address for creating better eviction sets, this can do that. So it's got a lot of really great tools, and it's battle tested. So there have been multiple nights when we're looking at coming up with some new graph or some new result for some deadline, and Pac-Man Kit has just been there. It's, it's quite reliable, and it, it does what it needs to do. So we think this is going to be a great tool for security researchers. Next up is Pac-Man Finder. So this is a Gaidra uh, script that lets you search any binary for Pac-Man gadgets. And so we ran this on the XNU kernel, and we found around 55,000 gadgets, you know, some data, some instruction. And uh, you can kind of tune your parameters. So if you're looking for only a certain type of instruction, you can specify that. If you want to limit it just to the system calls or, or functions that you can reach, you can do that too. So we think Pac-Man Finder is a great tool, and we're going to see how to use this to find a real Pac-Man gadget in just a few minutes. Next up is Pac-Man Patcher. So we're going to talk about the timing features of M1 in a minute, but the problem with M1 is that you don't have really great high-performance timers in user space. And so when you're doing those deep reverse engineering tasks, trying to build up a model of how the system works, you need really fine-grained timing. And so Pac-Man Patcher is a patch to Mac OS itself that enables these timers for user space. So no need to play any tricks. Just run this once, and uh, there you go. And lastly, Pac-Man OS is for those really, really deep reversing techniques where you really just need bare metal control. And so Pac-Man OS basically says, give me some Rust code, and I'm going to boot it right on the device. And so you're kind of left to your own. You can do whatever experiments you want, run right on the bare metal. That's Pac-Man OS. And so together, we think these four tools make up a really great suite of uh, reverse engineering technologies that you could use to do Apple Silicon uh, microarchitectural analysis. Uh, so one other th fun thing that you might want to play with, uh, this past semester, my lab and I just redesigned our secure hardware course at MIT. And so we released five brand new labs that let you do all sorts of really great stuff. So you can do the row hammer attack, where you flip bits in the physical DRAM controller. You can do Spectre in the kernel. And you can also implement an AI-accelerated uh, website fingerprinting attack that still works today. So if you want to play with some of these, you can Google MIT Secure Hardware Design and find any one of those five labs. And feel free to shoot me a, a tweet at Twitter if you try them out and you have a question. Just uh, feel free to reach out. All right, so Pac-Man 1 was what we released in ISCA a few months ago. And today we're going to announce Pac-Man 2. So Pac-Man 2 is a complete re-implementation of the first attack without some of its shortcomings, and it's significantly more efficient as well. So with Pac-Man 1, what we wanted to do was show that this attack is possible. So we built a proof of concept that proves the hardware behaves the way we think it does. But with Pac-Man 2, we want to show it in action. So what can this thing do when you really push it to the extremes? Pac-Man 1, we've got a very simple victim. Just, again, we want to show it works. Pac-Man 2, we're going to do it on a realistic victim, and we'll see that in a second. Pac-Man 1 takes around three minutes or so to forge a pointer. Pac-Man 2 can do it in as little as 11 seconds. Uh, Pac-Man 1 is a bare-bones C implementation, so one of the things we wanted to do was make sure that our tools we provide to the community are extensible and can be played with. Uh, Pac-Man 1 is, is more of just an imperative C reference, impl reference implementation. Uh, so messing with this and, and trying to change it is a little bit difficult. With Pac-Man 2, we've rewritten it all in Rust with an extensible framework that you can use to build your own Pac-Man attacks without having to reinvent the wheel every time. Uh, and so the major shortcoming of Pac-Man 1 was that we assumed we could do this uh, instruction TLB eviction with system calls. And that's a relatively realistic assumption, but the noise that this creates is actually a lot. And so doing this in practice is quite hard. Uh, with Pac-Man 2, we've removed that restriction. We do a different way of timing. So Pac-Man 2 doesn't have that problem. All right, so with that out of the way, let's talk about software. So we're going to look at this as CPU architects. Together, we're all going to des design a processor. And so our processor is going to have 64-bit addresses, right? That's the best way to do it, at least today. Maybe in a couple years it'll be different. 
Uh, and so our design doesn't have 16 exabytes of RAM. We don't, we're not using that much RAM in our, our computers right now. And so what it turns out is that these pointers actually just have a bunch of bits that we're just not using. They're just completely unused. And so let's use these bits for something useful. Let's put them to good use. And so what we're going to do is take, set aside 16 bits in every address as a signature that verifies the rest of the pointer has not been tampered with. And so we're going to compute the pack by taking together a hash of the pointer itself, a per object salt, and, and some secret key. But for the purposes of today's talk, we actually don't even care how this hash works. We're going to assume it is as strong as possible and cannot be forged. We have to brute force it. Uh, and so there's two instructions that you can use to, to operate on packs. You have the pack instructions that can insert a pack, and the ought instructions will verify a pack. And the important thing to note is that we do not crash, crash on the ought, we actually crash on the use. And so let's walk through a, a really quick example here. So here we've got an object hanging out in memory that's a sign pointer, and we'll see this exact object come back later. Uh, and so we're going to do a load to load that sign pointer out of memory into x16. We're going to pull the object's address and a per object salt, put that together, and that's going to be our object's uh, salt, and do the authentication with that in mind. So take the pointer and its salt and verify the signature. And so what happens is if the verification was wrong, that pointer that's been put into x16 is now just some corrupted pointer. And when we try to load it, this is where the crash comes in. All right, so let's talk about buffer overflows. So maybe you've got some, or in this example, you've got a buffer hanging out and then some function pointer afterwards. And you know, maybe you forgot to use the right version of string copy or whatever, and uh, the buffer overflow overwrites this function pointer. Now, traditionally, this is game over, right? Like, the attacker has got complete control of the function pointer. So let's fix this with pointer authentication. And so the key thing to assume is we're going to assume that same software bug still exists. Because remember, these, these are hard to find. And so we're going to do that overflow and corrupt the function pointer. But since the pack has been changed, we can detect that and actually crash. So pointer authentication can keep us safe in this case. So today's goal is to reveal the pack for an arbitrary pointer without any of those crashes. And for that, we're going to have to turn to hardware. And so we're going to solve the software problem that we have, which is that uh, using the wrong pointer crashes, and we're going to solve it in hardware. So we're going to start by guessing a pack speculatively to prevent a crash. And then we're going to leak the verification results of that test case through a side channel. And so we're going to talk about what both of those things are. And so let's switch back to CPU design mode. So we're going to build our processor with this feature called speculative execution. And the idea behind speculative execution is that we want to just incre increase performance. We want our processor to be as fast as possible. And so in this example here, we've got if true, do A, else do B. And so your in-order basic CPU is going to have to spend some time thinking about that branch and then just do the right thing, right? So it's pretty straightforward. But we can actually do better. So if we speculate the direction of the branch, we can predictively begin executing before we know we should execute. So in this case, we're going to start speculating that A is the, the correct direction, and in this case, we'd be right. And so we're actually faster than the uh, in-order case. But if we misspeculate, if we get the wrong prediction, now we've got to spend some extra time to undo the effects of that speculation and then do A. But you'll notice that this undo is only surface level. It doesn't undo every change that was made. It just undoes the ones that the programmer can see. And so the microarchitectural side effects of running B speculatively are not undone. So let's see what that means. And so we have a, a de design decision to make here. So how do we speculate on pointer authentication protected pointers, right? So we want to do this pack thing. We want to do the speculation thing. How do they come together? And so it seems to me that there are three basic cases. You can ignore them, just pretend they're not there. You can never load them, so if you hit a pack, just stop speculating. Or you could just treat them normally, right? Pretend like the, the program runs in order. And so these three cases have three very different outcomes. But the first one is actually quite surprising. If you ignore packs, that also introduces a security problem. And so you can read our paper to find out more about that. Uh, if you never load, this is slow. We want our processor to be as fast as possible. And so treating them normally is what the M1 does, and that's how we're going to do it too. And so let's take another look at speculation, but with pointer authentication in mind. So for this example, we're going to do if true, we're just going to leave the function. We're just going to return. Otherwise, we're going to do a check of a pointer and then try to load it, OK? And so for the in-order system, we're going to do the if and then return. No leaks. We're all good. And the speculative system can be good, too. So if we do cor predict correctly, we still don't leak anything. We never run the code we're not supposed to. But if we mispredict, if we run that wrong branch, we're still going to do the check and the load. And 
uh, if that load is incorrect, we're not going to actually load anything into the cache, but we're going to start a speculative exception. So there's two possible outcomes here. When we do the undo, all we do is undo the change to the X variable. We don't actually undo any of the loads that we just performed. And so that is going to cause a leak. So the value still being in the cache, this is going to leak some information. And so uh, operating on pointer authentication speculatively can leak correctness without causing a crash. So let's take a step back here and look at this from a bird's eye view. So we've got our first is a bug. Remember, bring your own bug. We're going to assume we can read and write into memory. We're going to write a guess into memory and then trigger, trigger the misspeculation to run the Pac-Man gadget speculatively. And so if we're correct, if our guess is right, we're going to do a speculative load. If we're incorrect, we're not going to load. And so those are the two cases we want to tell apart. So how can we tell these two cases apart? Well, let's actually take a step back and go back to our CPU design mode. So memory is really, really slow, and we want to speed it up. So what we're going to do is put a cache in between memory and uh, the CPU. And so this difference in the memory hierarchy, having addresses that can be cached or in DRAM, is where that difference comes into play. That's how we're going to tell them apart. And so let's just revisit how caching works really quick. So this is how we're going to represent caches today. Uh, you, have, you, you divide your cache into sets and ways. So in this case, we've got eight sets and four ways. And the way we put an object, or an address rather, into the cache is we take the address, pull out a tag, a set, and an offset, and we just look at the set. So we say which set of the cache we map to. So an address with two addresses that map in the same set will go to the same, same row in the cache. They can go into any column. We can't predict that, but we can predict which set they're going to go into. And so let's switch gears and think about this like an attacker. What can we do with the cache to do some type of attack? And so again, revisit the fact that these addresses, we predict which set they go into. We can look at the address and say which set it's going to be in. And so what we can do is develop the following. So let's fill up an entire set. We'll figure out how big the set is and just fill every line in the set up with our data. Then we're going to let someone else run. So this could be the kernel or just some victim. And it's going to do its own load pattern. So in this case, it has kicked out a couple lines. And you can see one of them hit the set that we're looking at. And we can reload our data and see if any uh, lines got kicked out. And in this case, one of them did. And so we can tell what the victim is doing. We can infer victim behavior just by watching addresses that we control in the cache. And so this technique is called prime probe. And we're going to see it again in just a few minutes. And so let's switch back to our uh, design perspective. So there's actually been a lot of confusion that we've seen on the internet about you know, what is the cache hierarchy of M1. And so these are, the, these are the numbers we pulled right from the silicon through the cache ID register. So uh, Apple's cache hierarchy is split up into a level one in data, level one instruction, and then a unified level two cache. So there's actually hierarchies within the cache. Uh, and you'll notice that data and instruction are cached differently. OK, so we've seen this actually before already, but let's, let's formally de define what we mean by a Pac-Man gadget. So a Pac-Man gadget is the speculative use and check of a signed pointer. And so in this example here, it's just any you know, if some condition, we're going to do a check, and then we're going to try to do a load. Anytime you've got that, that's a Pac-Man gadget. And so now let's walk through in detail how the data Pac-Man attack works. And so we're going to begin by training the branch predictor to use a known signed pointer. So we're going to enter this Pac-Man gadget, say if true, we'll pass in the condition true. We'll do this check on a good pointer that we know is going to be fine, and then do the load. And that's all good. And so we do that enough to tell the branch predictor, hey, we're going to take this branch all the time. So now it's going to start predicting that that branch will be taken. Now we're going to reset the cache, so just flush it out with addresses we control. And we're going to prime it by loading an eviction set. So let's go ahead and throw our eviction set in there. And now we're going to call this gadget again, but this time we're going to make the condition false. And we're going to load, instead of a correct pointer, we're going to load the pointer we'd like to guess. And so we're going to hit this condition and enter the speculative regime. So again, this should not be being run, but since the branch predictor believes it should be, we're going to start speculating on this. And so we're going to do the verification of our guess pointer and then try to load it. And now one of two things is going to happen. So if the guess was correct, the load will succeed and kick something that we own completely out of the cache. Otherwise, nothing's going to happen and the cache is going to stay as it is. And so all we got to do now is go back to our addresses we just put there and ask, did any of these get kicked out? If it was, we, were, uh, we had the right pack. That's the attack. And so now that we've done the attack on an abstract machine, let's actually do it for real. And so one of the things I want to focus on in this next section is not just what do you need to do to do Pac-Man, but I want to really encourage a discussion of what are the techniques that researchers use to do these kinds of attacks so you all can go off and do your own research using these techniques. So two terminologies uh, here for our, the rest of our attack. 
we have two operations we want to do. So differentiation, if you give me a correct and an incorrect pointer, can I tell them apart? And so we're going to look at graphs that look like this, where we've got on the x-axis uh, a number of cache misses, so zero misses being we didn't lose anything, seven or eight being like we lost a lot of addresses, right? And we should see two different patterns. So if the pack is incorrect, we shouldn't see any misses. If it's correct, we should see a lot. And uh, the other thing we want to do is brute force. So try every single possible pack and figure out which one's right. And so we know we want to get here. We know that we, in the end, we want to be able to say a correct pack leads to a load, an incorrect leads to an incorrect load. And so what do we need to do to make this happen? Well, first we need to know when a load occurs. And since we're attacking the kernel, we need to be able to tell when the kernel loads an address. And we can't look at these because we don't own these addresses. So got to do prime probe here. Next, we got to contend with the kernel in the cache. So before we can tell if a load occurs, we have to be able to measure whether or not the kernel is loading. So we have to, to form what's called an eviction set for this contention. Uh, and before we can even do that, we got to know if something's in the cache or not. So doing this very basic, is, is, the cache, is it a cache hit or a cache miss? And so to start, we're going to begin by reverse engineering the M1. And so we looked at four different possible timer sources, because again, we want very high performance timing data. And these first two you can just rule out. The first one's way too slow, and the second one isn't even present. And so we looked at these last two, the Apple custom cycle counter and our own multi-threaded counter, and we, we did some analysis on them, and we found that they're, they're both pretty good. And so what we can do is use the multi-threaded counter, we'll talk about that in just a second, we can use that in the attack because it's not privileged. But these, the Apple custom cycle counter, the one that we want for our high performance reversing data, is privileged. So we can't use that in our attack, but we can use it for reverse engineering. And so what you can do is go into Ghidra and search for any reads of this privileged timer. And what you'll find is that there's a couple places that do that. So we have PMC0 is our cycle counter. That's the one we want to read. And if you look at how it's uh, set up in the kernel, PMCR0, which controls whether or not you can use this register, doesn't set the user bit. So this bit is not set, which means that user space cannot read this pointer. And so if you look for places in the kernel that do the read that might leak its user space, there actually are a couple. And so there's these KPC system calls that are uh, masked. So you won't, if you do like sysctl list, you're not going to see them. But these are there. And this is actually what the, the private framework kperf uses. But these, uh, sadly, they require root. And they also take a trip to the kernel. So when you want to know what time it is, you actually make a system call, go through all this stuff. And then by the time you get back, you've wasted so many cycles that it's not really worth it for what we're trying to do. So that's not really an option. Uh, something else that's pretty interesting is this special dev perfmon file. So if you look at these, there's two of them. There's perfmon uncore and perfmon core. They're defined in this file here. These actually do give you access to the timers without root. So you can read all sorts of really interesting MSRs without any ever going to the root. But uh, it still takes a trip to the kernel, so we can't use it. Uh, but here's all the timers that I was able to dump for my machine. We're not really sure what all of them do, um, but they are pretty cool. So if you want to play with that, we have some code that can let you do that in our release. And uh, XNU will actually ship it too. So test slash perfmon test.c has some sample code in the kernel. So if we just need timing, why not just use a kext? Just install a kernel extension and set the timers up. And so we tried this. And actually, a lot of groups have done this. I believe it was Dougal Johnson who pioneered this. Um, but when you do this, the problem is when you switch cores, XNU will reset those timer values, and now that test case that you're running is going to segfault. And so you can get around this. Like, what we used to do is install a signal handler. Every, every time we segfault, we just restart. But that's, that's a pain, and it's really, really not a great solution. And so what we did is we came up with Pac-Man Patcher. And so the way this works is it actually patches your kernel cache to enable timers universally. And so all you need to do to run Pac-Man Patcher is download the kernel from Apple, run patch on the kernel image, and then just restart with the new kernel installed. And now you've got timers permanently. And so this is patching your kernel. We don't recommend running this on a you know, machine you use daily, but uh, I actually, I, as a matter of fact, I am running it on this machine right here. So <laughs> it works relatively well. And uh, OK, so let's talk about the multi-threaded counter. So the idea behind this is we just want to know how long something's taking. And so what we can do is just while true increment, right? And uh, this works surprisingly well. So this is our real implementation of it. For the uh, counter, we just inline assembly, you know, store, add, increment, run. And that way, we're, we're moving things very fast. And for the timing axis, this is where you got to be careful. It works best, in our experience, if you do a data synchronization, then a nested instruction synchronization between the reads, load, and then same thing in reverse. So this is how we do it. This works really, really well. And in fact, we did a, an analysis of it. And you can see that everything the timers can register from the Apple performance counter, you can still differentiate with the multi-threaded approach as well. 
So our conclusion is that the multi-threaded timer can do whatever the, the performance counters do, but you still want the performance counters for those high performance numbers when you're really just reversing stuff, right? Okay, so we can tell cache hits from cache misses. That's great. Now, how do we contend in the kernel? So this is where Pac-Man Kit comes into play. And so we're gonna do a technique called evict reload. So we're gonna start by loading the address we wanna measure in the kernel, do a, load a bunch of things from user space that might contend with it, and then reload the thing in the kernel to see if we were, were successful. And so we're gonna slowly build up this eviction set to see how, how far apart the addresses need to be and how many of them we need in order to evict kernel addresses. And so what we're gonna do is look at the uh, memory like this. So we've got different pages and different cache lines, and we're gonna have a stride that hits the beginning of every page and the beginning of every cache line. So the cache lines and the pages interfere. So you're getting contention in, in the cache as well as the TLB, which is another cache. Uh, and so this is how you compute those addresses. And if you do that, you get a beautiful graph that looks like this. And so you can see for three different strides, we've plotted three different uh, eviction patterns. And at 12 addresses, when you've got strides that are big enough, you see a, a jump. And at 23, you see another jump if, again, you have a large enough stride. And so we're gonna use this 12 address eviction set as our eviction set for the rest of the talk. And so great, we can actually kick kernel addresses out. If we do loads in a certain way, we can knock kernel things into a DRAM. So now how can we tell when a kernel load occurs? Well, to start, we're gonna talk about what happens when the cache gets full. So this is something called the replacement policy. And now most caches aren't gonna use a least recently used policy because that's actually very hard to put into to real silicon, but you can est estimate they approximate this, right? And so if we do four loads, we load A, B, C, and D in that order. When we wanna load address E, it makes sense just to kick out the thing we just least recently used, right? Because it's probably not gonna get used again. And so let's, let's try to load E and we're gonna swap A for E because again, A is the least recently used. So now if we scale this up to see how this affects prime probe, if we do an attack, uh, attacker load of A1, A2, A3, A4, and then try to load a kernel address that can contend with these addresses, here's what's gonna happen. So A1 is gonna get kicked out because that was the least recently used. Now, we're gonna go back and ask for those same four addresses in the same exact order. And so what's gonna happen is A1 is gonna replace A2, and then A2 is gonna come and replace A3, A3 is gonna replace A4, and A4 is gonna replace K1. So you can see that what was supposed to be one miss, we only had the kernel kick one of our lines out, has turned into four misses. Every address we put in there is now missing. And so by priming and probing in the same direction, you can trigger this cascade of misses that results in a huge difference that can be graphed very, very well. And if you don't want that behavior, if you wanna just see it uh, only one miss difference, we actually have a version of that too. And all you have to do is reload in the opposite direction. So Pac-Man 2 can do both. We uh, set it to the cascading mode because it's a lot easier to tell apart. Okay, cool, so we can do uh, tell when these kernel load, okay, loads occur. And you'll notice that all these techniques are very generic, like they can be used for many things besides just Pac-Man. And so now we wanna get to this last step here, uh, do the correct pack means a load, incorrect pack means no load. And so we're gonna have three target programs. We're gonna start with just the basic one to prove this works. We're gonna have an advanced program, which is a C++ object lookup. We'll talk about some restrictions on that. And then we're gonna have what we call ultra, which is a legitimate system call in the real kernel completely unpatched. Uh, and so our basic victim here is an if statement with lots and lots and lots of instructions that take a long time to run, gives us as much time as possible for our instructions to run, and then we're just gonna do a simple authenticate and load. And this is what it looks like. So when you, when you run this, the uh, data on the, on the left and the instructions on the right both look really great. You can actually tell with 99% accuracy which one is which. It's uh, quite good. But when you try it on this other instruction, so there's this third type of instruction, this BLRAA, which is a built-in branch and auth at the same time. What you're gonna see is actually this, this disjoint pattern where yeah, your correct packs look really, really good, but half of the time, your incorrect packs also look like they're doing loads. So what's going on here? Well, if you look at it, exactly 50% of the time, we're gonna do a load. And so what we think is happening is for this type of instruction, there's actually a race condition in the pipeline where the authenticate and the load kind of run in parallel. And one of them might run, right, finish sooner than the other one. And so half the time, the authenticate wins and you don't get a load. Half the time, the authenticate loses and you do get a load. And so we, we uh, classify this as BLRAA is actually vulnerable, but it's just a little harder to look at. So for the sake of our demonstration, for the rest of the day, we're going to remove BLRAAs and just look at BLRs. All right, so the advanced victim. So in this case, we have a different if statement. This is a more realistic kind of branch condition. And so we say if the user argument is less than some limit, we're gonna do a C++ method call, right? 
Uh, so a couple challenges with this, but let's start by revisiting the C++ method dispatch. So every C++ object is going to have this vtable pointer, which points to its table of functions. So we're going to have to do a data load from this table and then an instruction call from the, the table entry. And so there's two attacks that need to be done serially here, serially here. There's the data attack as well as the instruction attack, right? And so if you look at the assembly, this is actually the same object we looked at at the beginning. Uh, you'll see that we do the verify data pointer right here. And then we load the, uh, the contents of that data pointer and then verify them as well. So it's two verifies right in a row. And so what we'd like to do is set up the, the memory scenario such as that we have a forged vtable hanging out somewhere else that is signed correctly with a vtable pointer to that to a signed pointer to our code that we'd like to use. That's, that's the end game here. And so forging the vtable pointer is straightforward. We've just showed that with a, you know, directly replace it. And the reason that's straightforward is because we know a good pointer. We know that the original uh, vtable is, is located where it is. But we cannot forge this instruction pointer. And we can't do that because we don't know how to train the branch predictor on pointers in this location. Remember, moving a pointer breaks the seal. So we, we don't have a good pointer to put here. And so there's a little trick we can use instead is to actually train the branch predictor on the old vtable. So have the, the old training running with the old external method. And then when we want to do a test, we actually swap both the vtable and the vtable entry at the same time to do the, the trials in this forge table like this. And if you do that, it actually works. Uh, and so the, the other problem we have is that the speculation window is very, very short. And the reason for that is because when we're doing our test, we have five things we want to do. We need to do a load, a check, another load, another check, and then a call. And we have to do that all of that faster before the CPU realizes it's not supposed to be running that. And all the CPU has to do is do two loads in a comparison. Really, really simple. Uh, and so we want to make the limit variable take a lot longer to load so we have more time. So how do we do that? Well, we just solved that problem earlier on with uh, kernel eviction sets. And so if you imagine the cache, this is kind of your mental model of the cache, we've got the limit variable in the cache and that, that's loading way too quickly. We don't like that. And we also have an eviction set for that target address. Because again, we need to do the prime probe to know when the load is successful. And so if we're in the condition where the, the limit and the eviction set are not in the same set, we can just kick limit out with a second eviction set. So make the limit go all the way back to memory, and then it'll take forever to load. And again, we need to be in different sets for that to work. And when you do that, the load now takes a lot longer, gives you plenty of time in that window to do this, those tests and do the forge. And without further ado, let's actually do it for real. Um, and so in this example here, we're going to have a destination, which is kind of, you can think of it like a ret to win. It's just a giant knob sled, so lots and lots of knobs that ends in a branch to a log function. And so here on the left, we've got a log viewer trying to, to see if the kernel is doing any logs. And on the right, we're going to do the Pac-Man attack. And so I said earlier, Pac-Man 2 is an improvement on Pac-Man 1. And so one of the things that Pac-Man 2 does is instead of looking at every pointer in detail, it actually does two passes over the entire space of possible packs. And so the first thing that it does is it says, is this pointer potentially the right one? I don't care if it is the right one, but could it be the correct pointer? And if that is not possible at all, we don't see any misses, we throw it out. And so that way we can look at all the pointers really, really quickly by doing a cursory glance at all of them, comparing the ones that look promising, and then figuring, out, figuring them out from there. And so let's go ahead and launch it. We're going to start by forging that data pointer. You'll see we're picking up some hits, and we're going to keep track of those hits and how many misses they've got. And uh, you see we're going through the space really fast here, and it's almost done. And uh, there we go. So we're going to start looking at them, and we've got it. So we got the data pointer signed, and now we're moving on to that instruction pointer. So each of these iterations, we're going to train with the old vtable and then swap it for the new one right when we need to do the test. And uh, we're trying to forge to jump to that knob sled with our win method. And you'll see uh, we got it right, and the kernel can actually print that it won. So we were able to forge both a data and instruction pointer successfully. Thank you. And so now let's use Pac-Man Finder to do one last attack. And we're going to use this as a case study of doing this in the real kernel. So what we're going to do is tell Pac-Man Finder, I want all the gadgets for just the BSD system calls. And the reason for that is because those are really e easy to reach. So I can spend less time looking at the gadgets to see which ones are fitting my constraints. Now, if you were doing this as a, as a real attacker, you might want to target more specifically to the, maybe the text you're looking at or whatever. But in this case, let's just look at the BSD system calls. And so these ones look good. And of these, we pulled out this one right here. So memory status, available memory. And let's look at what this is doing. And so what Pac-Man find, uh, Pac Finder found was a very simple load, comparison, branch, 
and then a, a authenticated load. So it is your quintessential Pac-Man gadget. It's very, very uh, obvious. And so the branch condition is this proc plus 560, and the, the thing that's being forged is proc plus 10, which is kind of a bummer. We'll see why in just a second. But it is uh, forging things in the, in the process structure. And so if you look through the kernel, the, the pointer in question here is actually the proc.task structure. So this is the, the core task that belongs to that, that process, uh, and that's what we can forge. And so the branch condition is the memstat limit field of the process. And again, what we're forging is the task field of the process. But the problem is that these are in the same page, so our limit trick doesn't work. If we try to evict that limit, we're going to make, we're gonna make both loads take longer, and we've had a net zero change in the speculative behavior. So that's not a great choice of gadget. Another reason this is not a great choice of a gadget is because this is in a commonly used field in a frequently accessed page. So since this is hot kernel code, there's going to be a lot of loads and uh, writes to it, so it's going to be probably very high up in the TLB which means that you're not going to get super great eviction patterns and uh, a lot of noise. Um, the other thing is that since this is a very commonly used field across the kernel, many, many asynchronous threads might try to read from it. So you could have problems where your test case has an invalid pointer that gets read, dereferenced, and causes a crash uh, in, in, independent of the Pac-Man attack. And so we did this 12 times. Here's the first six results. You can see the first two look really good. Like we have that great differentiation pattern. Third one, we got a kernel panic. And then the other three, we just kind of didn't see anything. And it's kind of the same story for some of the other tests we did. So this one, th there is a signal there. That's, uh, there. There's some signal there. But the problem is that it's not super reliable. Again, for the reasons we discussed, it's not a super great choice of gadget. But the important takeaway is that for a gadget like this, when we win, we win big. It's very easy to tell that this is the correct pointer in this case. And, and when we fail, we fail safely. We don't report an incorrect pointer. We just report we didn't find anything. And so those are two great points that make this a compelling attack. But you do got to be afraid of these asynchronous accesses. So if you are running something asynchronously, you could actually result in a kernel panic, which is not super great. And so I want to return to this question we asked at the beginning. So at the beginning, we said Pac-Man is a vulnerability in Pac-protected systems. And we asked the question, is this a flaw? Is this represent a real flaw in the CPU architect's perspective? Or is this a consequence of us being greedy for more speculative behavior, as well as trying to combine that with a fundamentally incompatible feature? So is PAC fundamentally incompatible with Spectre or speculation, or is, uh, is there something we can do about this? So I, want, I leave that to you to come up with your answers. And I'd love to discuss this further with you if you have any thoughts on this. Uh, and so with that, all of our code is available on GitHub. If you go to this repo, we've got everything posted there, all the tools and the proof of concepts, both the ISCA code and the code from today. Uh, you can go ahead and go play with that. Uh, and uh, without further ado, that's Pac-Man. <laughs>